you get what you have now. All you've got is what you have now. I'll do this in like a few years when I've read more. Like I, I've got a list of books I need to read, then I can write it. All that means is you're never going to do it. People put off writing books because they're like, I'm just not quite there yet. No, it's like, no, you are. You're there. All right. What's up, everybody? This is Other Life. I am Justin Murphy. I just wanted to let you know that I write a free newsletter to thousands of people every week. It's where I publish my best work. I share events that you can come to and much more. We have an insane private community around the newsletter and it's free. Go check it out. Just go to otherlife.co. That's otherlife.co. When you subscribe, I'm going to send you a folder of PDFs that contain all of my personal highlights from a bunch of my favorite books that I've read over the years. So you'll get a million insights after just a few minutes of browsing these PDFs, really. They're really special to me and I just figured I'd share them with you all. So that's otherlife.co, otherlife.co. All right, James. I just got your book in the mail a few days a few days ago. I've been reading it. This is uh, your most recently published book, "Be Not Afraid," and it is a fictionalized account of your own conversion story, I believe. So I think we should just take it from the top. I think my audience will be quite interested to hear about your conversion story. Tell us how did it happen, and just take us from the top on that. Man, I mean, I, I yeah, I've thought about this obviously a lot. Uh, pretty much everything that's happened has been down to Twitter. Probably the same for you messing around on Twitter and then coming into certain spheres. So I was interested. I mean, I'll keep this fairly short, actually. I mean, I was interested in spirituality, ended up in sort of the alternative spirituality realm, because I think um, I have a theory on this, but I think um, maybe you would agree that uh, contemporary Catholicism, probably from sort of the Industrial Revolution onwards, tend has a tenden- had a tendency and still has a tendency to remove the more mystical and quote unquote spiritual elements from it to keep it quite an institutional uh, thing. And the spiritual elements are removed, which is one of the reasons I believe that a lot of young men in the West, young men and women in the West who are spiritually inclined tend to look at it and think, oh, there's not really anything there that's actually that mystical or spiritual to me. I don't really feel that much of a connection. So they head off in order to, to all these alternative currents. And then they're like, ah, the full truth isn't here, which is really what I experienced. And they're all they experience something pretty nefarious or damaging. And then they come around to the full truth in the Catholic Church, in my own opinion. Um, but also, I mean, the book really, the book is targeted towards a very specific subset of people that probably I came come across and still come across on Twitter uh, and various spheres that I've been in, which is young men and women in their early 20s who are fairly disillusioned with the modern world, um, looking to build something, but equally understand that the modern world can't also offer them uh, a way out from its own structure, but equally trying to make it clear to them that the Catholicism or the Christianity that the modern world puts forward is nothing to do with actual Christianity. So that's the long short of the story, really. Okay. Okay. But, but, but give us, give us some of the, the human details. How did it actually unfold in your own life? Ooh. All right. So in my own life, yeah, we'll go back to the alternative spirituality stuff, messing around with that stuff, places I shouldn't have been. Uh, and it's huge on the internet. That's huge. That's yeah, tons and tons of people and doing it, alternative spirituality. Yeah. Yeah. And the word, you know, the words esoteric and occult mean hidden. And basically people learn the lesson the hard way of there's reason things, are, there's reasons things are hidden. And a lot of these hidden things are completely fine for certain, a small percentage of people to use because they're of a certain caliber that they can sort of deal with them. Um, but in the sense that many of these currents are really saying to you to become your own priest, 99% of people can't do that and shouldn't be doing that. It's super, super damaging and you end up in all sorts of horrible messes. So I experienced on uh, in the level of sort of, you could say like a negative spirit, something that was like, man, there's there's some evil stuff out there that's not nice. And I think it is manifesting itself in the world uh, very, very, very clear ways, which, uh, yeah, I don't need to get into. But um, and from that, I was like, okay, well, evil exists, so therefore good exists and I want to be with the good. So then I started doing that, reached out to a priest, and I really lucked, I really, really lucked out in a way. I mean, I guess you shouldn't call it luck, I should call it God's grace, that I found a priest who was like everything I needed, who, who you know, was just brilliant and still is absolutely brilliant. Um, an ex-Benedictine, very, very spiritual, very feet on the ground, very wise. Um, I hope, hopefully he'll see this interview and, you know. But um, yeah, so then that, and then from there, so actually before that, I was interested in Christianity and then just from my own reading ended up with Catholicism just as a, it was an organic process that I ended up there. Um, really wasn't interested in Protestantism or these new forms. Those I just really consider 
just empty. No offense to them. Ended up with it was always going to be a choice between the Catholic and the Orthodox Church, which really I think have the apostolic lineage within them. I don't want to get into that debate because it's really finicky. Um, but for me, Catholicism, the main reason for me for the Catholicism was actually very practical in that I never felt I'd be able to remove the the foreign or exotic element from orthodoxy and end up leaning on that as some like exotic thing, which would then remove the responsibility of just dealing with sin and temptation. Whereas the Catholic church is very Western and it's almost like, look, just deal with your own heritage, deal with what you've been given. And I found it much more easy to assimilate into it. You know, the people are obviously in my church, very English, very British. Um, and so that was the experience. And then it was about a year of my own reading. And then I finally reached out to the priest. And then it was a year of RCIA before I finally got baptized and confirmed. It was pretty, it's pretty smooth. Um, you know, weird things happen along the way. You get granted graces and various bits and pieces. Yeah. But it's a beautiful journey. Fascinating. And your podcast, Hermetics, is, I would say, somewhat associated with esoteric themes, occult themes. So having having converted to Christianity... How do you now see the occult themes and the esoteric themes? Is there a is there a space for that in Christianity? Some would say yes. I mean, there are certain obviously Christianity is a huge, long running tent of of you know uh, theorization. So there are many many different strands of, of Christianity. Some of them more mystical than others. Some of them perhaps arguably um, having esoteric or occult themes. Um, what is, what is the place of that stuff to you now as a Christian? I think on the one hand, a big place of it for me is to understand it in the sense of either how it's damaging or where it, where it goes wrong, where it turns off. And I, But I also think that um, I'm very much of the opinion that ultimately with, you know, in agreement with people like Lou Marcos, who's, who's increasingly becoming one of my favorite contemporary theologians and other people in the agreement of that ultimately if there is one God as, as it is in the Christian tradition, then what we can say of the people who were pre-Christ, such as Plato, Socrates, etc., really they are making their best attempt pre-revelation to have an understanding of God. You can't just say like everything that they did was ridiculous. So in the sense, you know, in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, it says that there are rays or does it say beams of truth in other currents, but the full truth is in the Catholic Church, which is really my stand. It's like there is very helpful teaching in other places, but you just need to be very, very careful to not trip over and end up being sucked into something. So, you know, I think on the one hand, it's sort of like exposition, just looking at it and seeing like, what is this thing? And then on the other hand, it's almost like, let's just, you know, be wary of this stuff. But it, yeah, but I've done, I've started doing more and more Christian mystical stuff. And I think a lot of people are surprised at the amount of stuff that's out there that they just never knew about. I mean, it's really tucked away by the church. And I think that's really to their their detriment that they do that fascinating so let's talk about this a little bit tell us some of tell us about some of the best strands of christian christian mysticism that people are sleeping on that people should know about well the well i mean one the carmelites all the carmelites uh Teresa of avila john of the cross i mean it's just absolutely beautiful i know I, I wouldn't say people are sleeping on them but i think often it's seen as like very complex and very like well that's going to be heavy going and it's really not it's really beautiful it's mystical it's spiritual and how, how would you describe the essential teachings of the Carmelites or the essence of it? Well, the essence of the Carmelites is really, it seems to me to be, I mean, chastity is really their, their, their essence, but chastity of course has this deeper meaning of really of not having um, a, 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 a an acquisitional or possessive mindset of everything that you come across in life. So it's no longer a, a, a mindset of like that thing is now mine. And then I, control it in that sense it's a it's a mindset you know the word chastity obviously has this deeper meaning but a mindset of just sort of living am amongst things and amidst things as basically a very deep understanding that everything that's afforded to you as granted isn't yours it's sort of like oh i get to use this for a time uh, it's god's it comes from god everything is from god i get to use this from a time you thankful for that and then of course when it goes you change your mindset of like oh you know thanks for thanks for allowing me it um, and I don't think that has to lean into like a sort of degradation of private property or anything like that. Um, yeah, yeah. But there's, you know, Thomas Merton as well, I think is, but then you're already, a lot of people would say you're getting into murky waters. So I'm already sort of a, a, a murky Catholic. 
your your answer there is interesting because when a lot of people hear the word chastity, they think mostly about sex. That's the first thing that they think about. And you didn't even mention sex. You mentioned, you know, the things of this world and, you know, our general kind of non-possession of the things of this world. Uh, so I guess, in fact, the sexual case is just one example. Uh, so, so here you're basically seem to be suggesting that uh, sexual desire or sexual uh, lust, let's call it, is actually a kind of... Um, in a, only one example of a general uh, kind of acquisitiveness and it's it's that acquisitiveness and that possessiveness that's that's kind of the core and more general uh problem the key the key difference between love and lust is a possessiveness right in lust it, someone just becomes an an object to basically undertake your own fantasies whereas love is a a relationship between two people which is sort of uh, unified etc um but uh yeah completely lost my train of thought there no, that's okay. It's fascinating. I'm I'm only going to ask this again because I'm sure you have other answers. What are some other influences that were most uh, crucial for you in coming to to the realization of Christianity? Uh, C.S. Lewis was huge. The biggest thing I learned from C.S. Lewis was almost, in a way, what Christianity is. Now, a lot of very hardline Catholics, like you, they are, they either actually aren't very keen on Lewis at all, or they're like just read him and move on. And I think. That's where I'd stand is Lewis is really great at the start. Read him, move on. Um, and he's great to read. He's an extremely brilliant writer and fun. But what I learned from him was basically what Christianity actually is. So I was I was raised church of, in a Church of England school and basically was taught by the Church of England school, which for those that don't know is Protestant denomination, um, big in, in England, which really just becomes this very loose Christianity, which is tied in with various school teachings. I learned they taught what Christianity was in a way that I learned that Christianity quite literally wasn't Christianity. So when I read Lewis, I was learning Christianity for the first time. What they taught was not Christianity. They taught big man in sky with a beard, uh, you know, that absolute nonsensical uh, sort of caricature of Christianity, which atheists like to harp on about. Um, and, you know, there's, there's a, someone once said to me that church of England's produced more atheists than it has Christians, which, you know, I mean, I think that's, that's, Really, I don't want to judge them, but it's entirely true with regard to how empty their churches are, unfortunately. And they have the most beautiful churches usually in the UK. Um, and so that was experience. And then the other the other huge influence, of course, which who I took as my confirmation saint was St. Teresa Benedict through the cross. So St. Edith Stein. And, the, and I can't really tell you why. I mean, on the one hand, my path was via continental philosophy and Husserl, and that was the same as her path. And realizing that she she had the experience of, you know, you keep drinking the, from the cup of philosophy, eventually you go through atheism and then you come right back around to God. And a lot of it then looks ridiculous, you know, Deleuze and all that. Right? Um, and uh, but really, it was reading her biography that, that did it for me, which is why I chose her as my confirmation saint, because it was just a absolutely profound effect on me of like. I, and you, you, you might understand this. You just can't really tell why. But something is like, OK. That's completely what it is to be a Christian. Um, and yeah, so I think she, sh you know, in the, in a theoretical sense, Lewis taught me what it is to be a Christian. And in a practical sense, she showed me what it is to be one in everyday life, like to, to, to actually be one, which is a tough task. So say more about that. What does it look like to be a Christian in everyday life, according to Edith Stein? <laughs> Well, for, for her, I mean, it was absolute sacrifice every step of the way. Every single major decision of her life, once she um, accepted Christ, and even before that, was complete sacrifice. You know, so growing, she grew up in a in a very um, a highly, let's say, a highly pious practicing Jewish household, and she was clearly her mother's sort of favorite child. And you know, mother daughter relationship was extremely uh, deep and intense. And for her to then choose Catholicism later on was basically for her to sacrifice, you know, the, the relationship she had with her mother. Um, and then, you know, she, in a certain sense, she, she understood that she would have to sacrifice her academic career for when she became a Carmelite. And eventually they sort of said, no, you know, you should continue working, uh, which she did. And then eventually she, um, you know, she understands that she's going to meet her doom quite intuitively and instinctively in uh, Auschwitz and she sacrifices herself and which is why she's a saint she became a martyr um and you know throughout the whole thing of course the sacrifice of not having you know a husband or a love or children um and many many other things every step of the way for her was was giving herself over to God's will and 
you know, denouncing or un- trying to understand why that you shouldn't have the things in the material world. Yeah. And what I was going to say, that's where my train of thought was going just with the love and lust. I was going to say that it's interesting, you know, of course, when people think of chastity, it's completely understandable that they would think immediately of not having sex. But you might have experienced this as well, because I know recently you're, you've, you've, have you, did you, were you, a, were you cradle Catholic and came to the church or were you, did you complete conversion? I was cradle Catholic, but a very similar story as yours. You know, I, the Sunday school version of Christianity that, that I got was, pretty lame, no, no disrespect, but, uh, and you know, I, I promptly became an atheist as soon as I was confirmed, basically like getting confirmed as a cradle Catholic is kind of like, oh, when, when you no longer have to like go to church and be a, and go to Sunday school. And, you know, so it's like confirmation was really like an exit, uh, from Christianity. Wow. And I promptly became a modern atheist, you know, read all the Sam Harris books and thought I was like super, super smart and, uh, yeah. beyond all of that. And then, you know, Time takes its toll. You learn some things about life. And uh, it was really when I uh, became a professor in England that I started moving back towards it. Um, and it, for me, in fact, it was actually more, you know, a lot of people talk about how there's no atheists in foxholes. And there's this kind of idea that a lot of people have that uh, Christianity is just like a cope for people who are sad or suffering or there's like something missing in mm. your life and, or you can't handle the the burdens of existential, you know, torsion and, mm. and, and you turn to religion or Christ as, as some kind of make believe support structure. But for me, it was actually the opposite. And and I always tell people this, cause I think it, it, it's, it's very different than what people think. For me, I, my return to Christianity was more out of um, my, I, I, a kind of gratitude for my own successes in life and, and everything that I had. And um, I was actually, you know, as I, as a young, you know, in my early thirties, you know, I, I had been successful with my career. I had a wonderful wife who I loved and, you know, things were like really, you know, shaking out for me. All right. Like, I feel like I was, uh, I felt like I, I arrived successfully in my adulthood and, and my independence. And that's actually what got me more into Christianity because it was like, I just had this kind of overarching just intuition and sense at all times, like, you know, um, almost like I, I don't deserve this. Like I did not do this. You know, this is that mm. I did not do this. This, this, this is not, uh, this is not because I'm a genius or because I'm anything special like, uh, there. And I started to see like in my life, this kind of, um, you know, this kind of grace and, and, and many oppor- many, many moments in my life, I kind of looked back and saw, you know, it's not quite luck, but it's also not me either. And, it, it was mm. trying to kind of come to terms with that and feel whole with that and 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 really um, have like a truly adequate existential philosophy of the world and of myself that really made me start seeing the the um, the the correctness of of the Christian faith and that was when I kind of got more into it um, in a more authentic and voluntary adult way. Yeah, man, that's a super powerful thing to do, though. I've, I've done that before because I feel exactly the same way with the podcast and things I'm working on that you, you retrospectively look back and you realize like at certain points where, where at the time you really wanted the thing on the left to go right and to be, but you ended up going right. And then you look back, you're like, uh, something was, well, God was there, right? Like, you know, you go back to certain points, you like really wanted a thing and it didn't happen. You then look back and you think like, yeah, something was guiding me straight through. But I'm the same as you, man. I mean, the, 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 the thankfulness I have, like you said, like I'm not that smart. Yeah, I, you know, read a lot, put, I have put effort in, but I'm not that smart. This has all fallen into place really out of like an openness of being like, wow, I'm just really grateful. And if it ends, it ends. But other than that, it's like, whoa. Yeah. So let's talk about that a little bit because you're referring to your own career as a writer, as a podcaster. This is, I believe, is this your second or your third book that you've published? Be Not Afraid. Uh, third. third. Third book. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, you know, so you're, I would say, you know, I would say you qualify now as a, a fairly prolific independent author <laughs> and the Hermetics podcast has been running for several years now. I think you and I started around the same time, roughly. Um, yeah, four, and four years, so four years. Yeah, yeah, it was all down. To, it was all down to you. People forget this. It was all down to you. Huh. Oh, yeah, started. yeah. Because you interviewed Remind me that you. first. You interviewed me on. Was it was it just Justin Murphy podcast at that point? 
Maybe I forget. Yeah, it was on YouTube. But the first interview, or audio interview, I ever did was with you. I didn't even show my face at the time. And like four people messaged me afterwards. They're like, "Dude, you got a nice voice. You should start a podcast." And I was like, "Yeah, I thought on it." And now, four years down the line, I'm here. So it's it's down to you, oh, man. man. That's awesome. I for, I forgot yeah. that story. Um, that's awesome. Yeah. So you know, the other life podcast and the Hermetics podcast have a substantial overlapping audience. I think if you look at um, Apple Podcasts, like at the bottom of yours, it recommends mine. At the bottom of mine, it recommends yours. That means the audience is, is uh, very overlapping. And so, um, yeah, you've been doing this for a long time. You've published three independent books now. So I would love to just update my audience a little bit on, yeah, how things are working for you, what you're seeing, how things are going. Um, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I saw you tweet the other day that you basically just live a very modest and humble life. You keep your expenses low. And um, maybe you could talk, maybe you could talk a little bit about that. What is your, just give us a snapshot of your current, you know, work life balance and um, is, are the books and the podcast, is that paying all of your bills or are you doing some work on the side or what, what are you up to these days? Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, but one thing I'd say before that, you say that I'm a prolific independent thinker. I mean, if I said that to you, would you sort of, if I said you're now a prolific independent tech bro and writer and thinker, would you sort of laugh internally still? I think I would be offended if the first thing you called me was a tech bro. <laughs> not a tech bro. Not a tech bro. All right. Uh, <laughs> Point taken, though. I I, I know I kind of thinker. roll in those circles. I mm. roll in those circles a little more nowadays. So I, I hear you. Um, I guess I'm uh, objectively somewhat prolific. I think um, like slightly above average, but no, I, I wouldn't. Um, I aspire to be much more prolific. So in my own mind, I'm I'm uh, inadequate. But I, I think objectively, I'm I'm you know I, I publish to the newsletter writings like more consistently than, than most people, but in my own eyes, not prolific enough. Why, how do you think about it? No, I just, it's just, it, I think it's just something I started doing. And then all of a sudden people are like, you know, just calling you certain things. I don't know. Someone, someone in an email called me like famous podcaster the other day. And I was like, <laughs> I don't know that. Well, nowadays with the internet culture, everything is super, super relative, right? So it's like, um, because there's all these tiny little worlds, but for the people in those worlds, those tiny worlds are the worlds, right? So, you know, for a certain type of person, you know, there's probably hundreds of people out in the world for whom you are a famous person, right? And then there's, you know, most of the world for whom, you know, you, they've never heard of you, same with me. Um, but it's like for those types of people who, for whom this world is their world, then you are genuinely famous for that person. It's just like like weird nowadays because there are so many little microcosms that for the individuals in them are more or less the whole world. Yeah, that makes sense. But uh, to, your, to your first question, I mean, with regards to the tweet I made about like living a really, I, would, I, I can't call myself humble, right? Like Donald Trump where he's like, I'm really humble. I can't say that. But I live, a, <laughs> I live what many people would consider like a very simple life. But it doesn't seem simple to me. I still feel like I have too much stuff. But in terms of like, I, I tweet about this, like over the last few years, if you look at the UK definition of the poverty line for a single person income, like I've fluctuated below and above it just about. And I live a very comfortable life. Like in my opinion, very comfortable, like, I can buy books when I want. I can still go out. I drive. Um, you know, I you know, I rent a two bedroom flat for myself right by the sea. And this is on at certain points on quite literally poverty wage. So I think something's really gone wrong with the definition of poverty. Um, and for me, this was a big profound thing in relation to like if you can undo the idea of what a normal uh what they what do they call it? Standard of living, like the UK standard of living or the general standard of living is because that's what's going to make you miserable, right? If, if they say the standard of living is X and you need A, B, C, and D to have a normal standard of living and you don't have them things and you assume that that's how it should be. Like, you know, like I don't have an amazing dishwasher. I don't have a fridge freezer that makes ice or something, you know, all these things that they <laughs> assume that you should have. And I don't have any subscriptions and people are going to get really miserable about this. But at the same time, it's like, we're just, you know, like Dwayne Elgin titled his book Voluntary Simplicity, and he wanted to call it Voluntary Poverty. But he said, I couldn't call it that because there's so many connotations attached to the idea of poverty that people will be like, oh, you want me to live on the street? It's like, no, just live a simple life. And so that's pretty much how I lived. And yeah, the podcast and the books, I mean, the podcast alone now covers all my bills, but they're not they're not much. I mean, I like being transparent about these things because I think I think people coming into the independent sphere that we're in, especially these ex-academics, I think they have a panic of like, what's the money going to be like? 
Um, and so I'm fairly transparent about this, that really I'm, hmm, should I be transparent about this? Yeah. We, yeah, we try to we try to be the same way because it's so helpful for people. I it is cares. helpful for people. I earn from the podcast about between twelve and fourteen hundred GBP a month, and that just the podcast, and that covers my bills. That covers everything. So it covers rent and food, and then after that, like the books, the book money isn't really that much, as you all know. It's not a huge amount, and and then the ad revenue, and I mean that covers like little extras that I need. But the big thing from that is, I mean, many people out there would just would be like, oh, there's no way I can survive on that. But if they cut their costs down and cut out the things they really don't need, and cut out getting cars on credit, and also working from home and being self employed, suddenly cuts out a ton of expenses you didn't realize you were you were having from working from for an employer. That, that I don't know, I can't even really put my finger on them, but certain things, you're you're less stressed, you have more free time generally, um, you, you're happier because you're doing the thing you actually care about. And once once you're truly doing something that you, you're you like, I, I want to see this thing grow over the money grow, that's when it just no longer really matters. And I don't want to be one of those guys who's like, I don't care about money. I care about money to the extent that it allows me the freedom I want. That's about it. Totally. So now that you've published three books, uh, tell me a little bit more about how you see book writing in in all of this, because I know you said a minute ago that the books don't make a ton of money. And I've only done one uh, short book so far. So I have some sense. I I, I suspect we're in the same ballpark, roughly, uh, in terms of numbers on that. And it's like, yeah, it doesn't make a ton of money. But on the other hand, you also kind of look what is kind of cool about publishing books on Amazon is that sales do seem to come in pretty consistently each month, a small number, but they come in each month without necessarily doing any work for marketing them because Amazon is basically just the biggest search engine in the world for books, basically. So what is kind of cool about Amazon and publishing on Amazon is, you know, every month you get some number of sales and you don't have to do any work for that. And you do kind of, if you, if you kind of squint at the sales numbers, you do kind of look at that and you're like, you know, Okay. And if I had 10 books on here, you know, then we're, then we're, then we're kind of approaching some interesting numbers. And if you assume that that grows a little bit over time, um, as each book kind of lends, you know, some publicity to the, to the back catalog and so on. I, I kind of wonder how you think about this as someone who already has three books and, and, you know, the short span of, of a few years. Uh, do you think about that? Do you think like, oh, maybe my strategy over the next year, next few years should just be to, um, have a whole big catalog on there and that could actually be a, a major source of income over the long run. Do you think about that or no? Yeah, no, I have thought about that. And I mean, that, that same thing applies with the podcast. You've probably felt the same way that I think, you know, I don't, I, me and you both, I imagine in the same ballpark again with ad revenue, but sometimes I think, well, actually, you know, I'm not one of these guys who's getting millions of views per thing and they're actually literally relying on ad revenue. But at the same time, we're both consistently putting out videos and I see my ad revenue slowly, slowly going up. And as you say, as that's going up, the interest in the channel's going up, so it's all compounding. And I think actually, if you double the amount of time that I'm putting into the podcast, it's like by the time I've done another I don't know, 100 or 200 videos, whatever that are public, yeah, actually this will be all right. So it's really like you know the the eighth miracle of the world or whatever, the eighth wonder of the world of compound interest with regard to that with with regard to the book sales as well. And I think that's how a lot of independent writers do make their money. Is yeah, you've got this book that you wrote 20 years ago. It's only bringing in. 50 to 100 pounds a month, but actually that's not too bad. How do you think about video in your larger portfolio of, of work? Like is, are the, um, are the videos on YouTube just basically video versions of the audio podcasts or are you actively making uh, standalone videos? as like a separate project. Um, how do you think about that? So with, I don't really know why I never asked guests in the start if I could record the videos and it, it, it is strange to me that for some reason something that is a primary audio primarily an audio thing actually you do get more you you do get more views and a longer view time on youtube if you just add this video of people just chatting i don't know why people are really watching it or what that has to do with people's psyche but i think they need something to just watch while they do it which is really odd to me um but basically if the guest now i'm like well if the guest's okay with me taking the video then i'll um add the video in i mean i do my own video like the solo video things for myself. It's just something I've started to do. But the video is on and off for me. I'm fairly, um, I don't, in a certain sense, I don't want to fix what's broken. And I don't, I sort of, I've always expected quite a bit from my audience and I've never really pandered them. And I think that's a huge mistake a lot of people make is sort of pandering to their audience and treating them with kid gloves and things like that. I don't think they, 
I don't think they respect that at all. So I, you know, I never, never, one of my, my ethos is really, I mean, in a way it's sort of put me against the wall in a way because like I don't do intros, I don't do outros, I don't do filler and I don't, I've said I'll never do adverts, but there you go. So it's, I'm sort of stuck with that now. So maybe some other topics to discuss. I know that you recently talked with uh, Catherine about tokenization and the metaverse. I, I would love to hear some of your perspective on this new kind of Web3 revolution, which, you know, when you and I first met a few years ago, this was nothing, right? Uh, I mean, obviously, Bitcoin existed at that time. Ethereum existed at that time. But um, this kind of Internet culture of, uh, you know, Web3, what is called Web3 was was really not a thing. And so how do you think just I'm curious, like, what are some of your uh, basic pr principles or perspectives on kind of this rising tide of, of crypto culture on the internet, especially how it intersects with with the creator economy? I think the rise, I mean, I'll have to, uh, you know, do you, do you a service and mention Urbit because I think really things like that are really the the future, which is people want complete control. Um, and I think the big thing with Urbit, which is sort of staring people right in the face, but but often isn't put forward i mean maybe you have you've obviously done a lot more on urbit than i have but really i think what people want in the future is web3 utility and web1 aesthetics right the web2 middle ground was so horrible because you end up with these convoluted annoying sites which now are getting worse and worse and worse to the point of you can't even literally literally can't use them unless you've the fact that you can't use a utility unless you also install like three other add-ons onto that utility, you know, like ad blocker, cookie stopper, and it's like, right, I can finally use your website, right? So for instance, I mean, just to take one example, something like someone links something from the Washington Post, I click on it, there's a ton of adverts, the cookie thing comes up, another thing comes up from the bottom, and then finally get through to it, and it says that you have to like sign up and subscribe to even see the content. And all I do, if anyone from Washington Post is listening, is click off the site and never go back to it. So I'm just not going to use your thing. And so people, I think we're getting to the point where people are really interested in bare bones content like Urbit. I mean, there's there's no distractions, no nonsense, no rubbish. And yet at the same, it's implicitly, it's clearly having extremely advanced utility. And so it's sort of that, if you could consider that an aesthetic, what people want in the future, I think is, basically MySpace customizability with Web3 utility where you, you know, complete ownership. Um, and a lot of the centralization that's come through on Web2 has just ruined the freedom of the internet. I mean, that's not anything new to say. Um, as for the metaverse, um, to be honest, at this stage, once again, I think it's going to fall flat. Uh, we still aren't able to really do the whole like, physical apparatus on our eyes with like VR and people just don't want to be wearing that stuff. So until there's a very easy fix that's affordable to do it, I just don't see it going forward. And ultimately that means that the metaverse access by desktop just becomes a sort of very crappy MMORPG like that we used to have back in the day, like a social MMO. And I just don't see boomers using it which is like the primary audience at the moment, right? Are you attracted to some of these different experiments and practices when it comes to, you know, using NFTs as a kind of soft form of cultural fundraising or maybe even the social tokens that some uh, creators and communities are experimenting with? I'm just curious, is, is there anything uh, kind of in this new Web3 space where you look at it and you're kind of like, oh, this is really exciting and possibly liberating, especially from your perspective as, as, an, as an independent writer or as a podcaster. Urbit. I mean, I'll be yeah. really honest, because what Urbit is trying to do, I mean, this is the problem that every, I think a lot of people are seeing, especially people in the independent thinkersphere who are trying to not, they're trying to like pseudo centralize. So not fully centralized in the, say, in the sense that it's under an institution, but centralized like, there is no single thing on the internet at the moment which will thread together in a cohesive way all the different channels that I need, right? Like Discord, Forum, all the different varieties of paying me or subscribing or all this into one coherent way. There's there's really clunky ways of doing it and, you know, on the back end and things like this, but they just don't work and it's it's really bad. So I think that, I mean, yeah, so that's one thing. NFTs. You know, I think once again, the crypto bros did a lot of damage to them in the sense that once again, they promoted like the, they don't mean to, but the get rich quick thing 
it's like you should have promoted the utility and there is a utility there. De there definitely is a utility there, but not for JPEGs. Like that's the worst use case for them was images, you know, and the, and, and the use case for like, you know, rare collectibles or like, you know, a ticket for an online event or things like that. That's completely the use case. But JPEGs was, it was just entered back into the whole crypt, trip, crypto gambling thing. So it's, gonna, it's like a lot of damage needs to be undone. And we still aren't focusing on the utility and use case of crypto over the that side of things. And unfortunately, the bastion of non-Bitcoin crypto, Ethereum, basically is unusable in the sense that it's meant to be used. Right? You can't have the fees that the fees for payments on Ethereum and say it's a usable network. Like, oh yeah, Ethereum's great. It takes like a minute to, for a transaction. It's like, all right, how much is a transaction? Like 50 bucks or whatever. It's like, that's not a network that works. It didn't used to be like that, but they need to fix it before going forward. And yeah. Right, yeah, right. Urbit, okay. Urbit, basically. Okay. I'll do you a solid, Justin. Just say that Urbit really is the thing I want to see. I mean, you, you say you say that as if like I'm the owner of Urbit or something. It's not my. Thing. I no, think you're one. Of, you're one of the, the main yeah. guys though, promoting it. Like you're the main person I see promoting what? it and and promoting it via using it and showing us what can actually be done with it. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I get that. So uh, it totally makes sense. It's just funny, like, uh, so I, I've noticed people are starting to get weird notions, like people think I'm being paid by Urban or I'm someone even in some tweet, like referred to me as like the owner of it or something like that <laughs> ridiculous. And uh, yeah, no, I'm, I, I don't think of myself as even promoting. It. I think of myself as like, oh, I just think that people really don't understand this. And it's actually one of the most weird and strange and exciting and promising uh, vectors of internet culture opportunity that I see. So that's why I've just been banging the drum about it. Cause I just, I just think it's cool. And I, I think people genuinely don't understand it. So, and I've kind of fallen down the rabbit hole. So um, that's really all, but um, you recently tweeted that advertising quite literally is Renaissance magic. I thought that was interesting. And you say, you say read Bruno and Culiano and specifically Bruno's on magic of bonds in general. So tell us what, what did you learn from Bruno's On Magic of Bonds in general? Well, this is that book is mostly cited in uh, Jon Culliano's uh, Eros and Magic in the Renaissance, which really goes through to the fact that uh, the same tactics which are using being used in advertising, which is basically in the sense that uh, very roughly, uh, you could say that uh, this isn't how it's described, but describe it very quickly for your for the audience. The senses in the sense that they're some, sensing something else externally to them and then, and then taking it in, there is for Bruno the potential for that to actually come through and be taken into the soul, quote unquote, uh, very roughly. And so in this sense, what's happening and, 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 and in the Renaissance, that was a way of sort of hypnotizing people or getting them to believe a certain thing or to act a certain way. And really, we're just seeing that exact same form of creating what is considered a bond between an artificial desire on the outside comes in and actually sort of actually becomes part of your identity, part of your being. And it takes quite a lot of um, strength to be able to even see that's being done to you. And if it's done to you from a young age, then then that's what's what's happening. So yeah, I mean that's the that's the long and short of that one, but I, I don't think that's anything new or, or radical to say that that advertising is. I don't think, but but I think maybe you feel the same way now after your conversion. That, but I think a lot of the problems that I tried to rationalize when I was a bit more political, a bit more I don't know epistemological or whatever, when I was an atheist or things like that, when I was into neo reaction, blah blah blah. You realize that most of these are spiritual problems, and once you once you once you truly believe in the soul, that has huge connotations, right? Like most of these things are to do with one's soul now and and what's actually going on in their being in relation to the soul. And so most of the problems that I used to see, are I just see them as basically spiritual problems now. What is the best way to think about the soul? What is the soul? A lot of people hear that word or they hear those types of words and they kind of just think, oh, that's just Christian mumbo jumbo. It's just this kind of uh, make-believe concept that we use. Um, but I think you and I, uh, perhaps see it a little bit more deeply well the way the way i think about it because you know as a as a catholic it's faith and works not by faith alone right and that's in uh james um so the idea of works right and i, I think for people coming to christianity from likely from a materialist framework i would say to them that the so the soul the soul is ultimately what's going to be weighed up so to speak uh and judged by god 
right? The, the soul, which makes little sense to people who aren't Christian. Well, hang on, what about the body? The only sense in which the soul can ever act is via the body, which is to then say that the only time you've really got to prove yourself and act piously and thus do works and be faithful is when you have a body. Therefore, the only time you have to really secure your your position in heaven, hell, purgatory, and to be judged, you only have your lifetime uh, in the body. And so I like to think of the soul as basically the thing which is being uh, imbued with, I don't know, you could you could say lightness or darkness, with evil or good, with uh, like a green light or a red light, and eventually you get to the end and they go, all right, we've looked at your soul, you're coming in, we've looked at your soul, you need a bit more time in purgatory, or you know, we've looked at your soul, it's tiny, there's only a little ember and you don't care about anything straight to hell. So if I think for materialists, I don't want to say that you earn your soul, you have a soul, everyone has a soul. But in the sense that um, going to hell is turning away from God, I think in the same sense, one can actually almost turn away from the fact that they have a soul. So in that sense, they're basically just taking their being and their existence for granted. And therefore, they, they understand all the acts that they do and the works they do in the world just off their own ego. And so just think about the soul as, it, this really cheapens it, but in a certain sense, as it's the thing to be judged, it's like almost like keeping your ticket to, to the afterlife in good, good, good stead. You know, thinking about the acts, not in a material sense of like, oh, that's good for that person in the material world, which is where the, the sacrifice and actually doing the tougher, tougher thing comes in. It's thinking about everything you do in relation to what would it do to sort of imbue my soul more with the light of God. And often that is making the choice that you wouldn't think, right? Like being a Christian isn't always being quote unquote, super nicey, nicey and doing everything for everyone. Sometimes you do have to draw, draw the line and it's, that's where the tough decision happens. I see. Interesting. And so since the soul is actualized in a body is this why Christian men have an ethical obligation to get jacked? Or do they? Do they have an ethical obligation? They haven't, I think, I mean, this is a really difficult, this is a difficult question because at the same time, I do think the church, the, the tradition as a, as a, I mean, they take the metaphor of a flower, like tradition, the root of tradition always stays the same, the species stays the same, but in the context of the world, the flower has to grow differently, right? So in one context, you think like, what is the normal body type for our age? it's probably a dad bod, to be honest, if not bigger. So you think, well, actually, I, that's more prideful, I would say, in a certain sense than looking after yourself and having a six pack. But six pack is always the reason you're doing it. I mean, you could ultimately be a absolutely six, you know, six foot six bodybuilder with 40 inch arms, whatever, massive biceps with a 2% body fat. But if you are internally humble enough to truly not see that as a prideful thing, then ultimately that would be fine. That's not really going to happen. But I think it's your, you know, you have been given a body, you've been afforded some, you know, this sort of vessel to experience the beauty of the world. To not take care of it is, is, you know, it's your duty to take care of it. But in the same, but in the same sense, not become prideful or take it for its own good. It's a difficult balancing act. But in terms of all the sins of the, in terms of all the sins of the world, right? Like getting jacked is, a lesser of many, many evils. Right. Well, yeah, it's a difficult balancing act, but that's why, that's why they call it the straight and narrow, right? It's like, it, it's a tight, it's a tight rope basically. Mm. Mm. And I was so, going to say that earlier about when, you know, about the conversion and you said about how people think of chastity with, with lust. And it's an interesting thing that as soon as I became Catholic, one of the things a lot of friends and a lot of people immediately say to you is like, Oh, no sex before marriage. Like their first thing is, always sex and you like you realize how deeply imbued just the sexual revolution and the idea of promiscuity as the ultimate terminal freedom is in our society like that's the first place people go is but what about sex and what about uh self sex if we call it that <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely yeah it says a lot about how people fixate on that I think I would be good to return a little bit to book writing. I want to learn a little bit more about this because, you know, as someone who's uh, published three books independently and in, in the course of about four years, um, I, I suspect that you've learned a lot. I'm curious. Yeah. What are some lessons that you've learned about how to write a book on the Internet, how to how to conceive of a how to conceive of a book? Maybe we could talk a little bit about the, the conception layer or conception stage when you think about, huh, 
I feel like this idea or this set of themes that I'm interested in should become a book or maybe it shouldn't become a book. Um, framing it, you know, uh, things like selecting a, a frame or a title. Uh, and then, you know, we, we could kind of talk more about the other stages of the process. Um, how do you think about, you know, when you decide to write a book, what goes into that decision, maybe projects that you've considered writing as books, but decided, oh, no, that would not make a good book, or I don't want to do that as a book. Just tell us, tell us, like, how you decide to write a book and what, what you've learned uh, about what goes into that. It's actually something you said a, quite a while ago in an interview about what an online and independent thinker really is, is ultimately someone who has some truths, right? You just have, and then there might not be amazing truths and you might not have even realized that you had them and you just write out some blog posts that you, you think, ah, oh, these are pretty basic thoughts for me, not trying to be arrogant, but sometimes you might have come to conclusions which other people either can't articulate or they, they you just think, oh, I didn't realize people needed them. And so it's like the conception of a book. I mean, I wrote the Exiting Modernity series and it was just happened to be quite popular and people are like, wow, this really resonated with me. And it's certain things like that. You think, oh, okay, actually there's probably more to it than that the same with the nick land thing i just had the sense that that would be um you know an interesting book to write that almost like i needed to write to get nick land out of my system uh, and it did the job um and so that's that i mean and, and with so you know the idea of like where do you get your idea for for write what to write is pretty difficult but however in terms of how to write a book i can give you some extremely practical very boring advice because i have a very uh, autistic analytic writing style which which I'm happy to be transparent about and I have been with people before which is that um, I'll get a sheet of paper or I'll get a notepad and once you'll probably understand this once you have an idea of the book you sort of see how it's going to play out roughly and I'll begin to write out like the major sections like the chapters I'll be like yeah that's probably how it's going to go and then in those sections I will write out like I'll go through them in my head and play them out but like oh that'll be a scene that'll be a scene that'll be a scene that'll be a scene like a film and then next to those scenes, I'll be like, yeah, that's roughly going to be that long. Then I'll write 500. I'll create a legend. So like a square is 500 words. A slash is 1,000 words. A circle is 2,000 words. And it might go up to like 3,000. But I wouldn't go beyond that. And then all I'll do is I'll end up having 20 to 50 scenes, each with an amount that roughly I think, yeah, that's how long it'll be. That's how much that general idea needs. And then I'll set, say to myself, right, each day you need to do two scenes. And all of a sudden, it just cuts what is like, you look at a book, like writing a book, people think you're just going to sit down and just write it straight out. It's like, no, just cut it down into super, super small chunks. Like you're allowed to do that. You're allowed to basically gamify writing because otherwise you don't get anything done. And it's so much easier to look at a book and go, okay, I've got 50 things I need to do and I'll do two a day. And then all of a sudden in, um, you know, however many days, 100 days, uh, you know, three months, three, four months, I've got a first draft. And that really is the best way to do it is just to set yourself these very clear goals. Don't go over them because then you start tiring yourself out and just be happy that you've done them. And then once you're there, like, you know, editing is a huge part. It's 50, 50 writing and editing, but writing is definitely the more laborious part. Once, you know, ultimately if you've got a scene, which is like, you know, one piece of advice I'd give is if you've got a scene in your head that what happens really is that one character walks into a room, picks up a, a pen and then he leaves the room. Don't like think about like, I need to describe everything. It's 200% better to just write the words. John walked into the room, picked up the pen and left the room. You've, you've got that then. You've got something to work with. Just don't, don't, leave, don't stare at the blank page too long because you just, you just end up paralyzing yourself and nothing gets done. You know, if you want to write even a theory book where you're like, you, you know at a certain point you have to, I don't know, overview something, I don't know, about Deleuze, just write out like, okay, this is what it is roughly and just come back to it, you know, just to have it done. Like, like it was a, an amazing thing that I've really tried to abide by as well. You wrote a really great piece recently about when you go, I'll do this in like a few years when I've read more. Like I, I've got a list of books I need to read, then I can write it. Or like, I'll start writing this once I've wrote, written the the intro stuff to it. It's like, you know, that all that means is you're never going to do it and it won't get done. Either you write it now or it doesn't get written. And that's, it's just true. And for people like, people put off writing books because they're like, I'm just not quite there that yet, there yet. No, it's like, no, you are, you're there. You just, you just, you, you get what you have now. All you've got is what you have now. And either you don't do something or, you know, that whole like, oh, I'm going to write the, the American novel and I just need to get there. You're not, you're not going to write it. <laughs> 
I, lo I love it. I, there were two key things you said that I want to pause on for the audience. One, one is that uh, basically, and these are both things I, I believe also, which I tell people, you know, in my audience, you know, I do different like indie thinkers or the little groups that I maintain to help people do this kind of stuff. Like uh, one thing you said is move fast, basically on the first draft and just your goal for the first draft is to just get it done pretty much as fast as possible, not in a rushing way, like not because you're like, you know, trying to rush through it. But just because the simplest, quickest way is always the best way for the first go, basically. I completely agree with that. And also you said, you know, when you were talking about just chunking it down and making it this really demystified kind of gamified thing where you, your goal is just to do two two bits a day. Um, I agree. Something I often tell people, the, the terms I like to think this in are that, you know, the, if you look at uh, standard publishing practices and norms, the, the the word count for a small book on, on the low end, basically, <clears throat> a small book uh, should be at around 20,000 words is a, is a reasonable, um, you know, marker quantitatively for the, the minimum word count you need for a small book to be just meaty enough that it's not like too, too flimsy. Um, there's some wiggle room around that depending on the type of book or whatever, but for a nonfiction book, generally 20,000 words is the, 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 the low end. Uh, but if you can hit that, you have, a, you have a decently sized little small book. And, um, if you think about it, that's really, you know, only about, you know, uh, 20 blog posts is how, what I tell people. If you, if you write a, if you write a blog post or a newsletter of about a thousand words each, you really only need to do 20 of those to have a small book. And so I, I completely agree with that way of thinking about it and that way of looking at it. Um, a book is really just an aggregation of a much more doable number of, of small pieces. And of course you wanna add some structure and you wanna think about how they cohere. But um, yeah, I completely agree with that. So what about when you're done with the book uh, or you're done with the draft? Um, do you pay editors to help you clean it up? Do you do it all yourself? Um, what do you do? Um, my editing process, so my, the way I write, I do, I do still hand write. So I hand write the first draft and then I'll type that up. And then my editing process is usually, I usually like have th two or three passes. So I have like one for spelling, which generally you can just automate via spelling software. One for like proof, one, one for proofreading or like start with the editing one, edit through, basically I highlight the whole, once again, I'll gamify this. I'll highlight the whole text with like a yellow highlight. And then I'll be like, right, you've got to 10 pages a day. And then you unhighlight them or you change them to a different color to say, this now needs to be proofread, like not edited, but proofread. And then that you just, anything to basically see, like I've just got to get to this section. It's all basically like cheapening the gamified things of like grinding for a sword in a game, right? You're like, oh, I just need to do that extra 10% and I'm almost there. And then when you start seeing it, it's like, I'm so close. Then you pick up the pace because you really want to see the finished thing. Um, and then the best way to the best way to truly proofread if you don't want to pay someone, read it out loud, which I usually, I will do when I'm going through because you, you're, you, you won't slip up as much. Um, you won't pick up as many of your own mistakes. Uh, and I have had like, sometimes I'll send it to a friend and say, look, I'll give you a copy for free and they're just nice enough to proofread it for me or do do certain bits and so you, you 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 don't outsource any of this you don't pay anyone to help with any aspects no i don't think i have you do the covers yourself as well yeah i do the covers myself but i did i did, did go to art school so they're all right oh yeah nice nice yeah, yeah no they look they look good for sure yeah. okay interesting so completely independent and you don't really do too much in the way of like big launches or how do you think about marketing and launching i don't know i don't know I'd be interested to know how you feel about this, but I just from personal experience, marketing, I, I think 90% of marketing is whether or not the content's good. It's a super boring thing to say that good content markets itself, but that's that's True, basically been totally my right, experience yeah. has been if you make something good, if it doesn't take off, that you probably were just unlucky. But the chances are, yeah, it'll take off. And any paid marketing I've done for the podcast, anyone who's looking to start a podcast, get into that as a career, don't do paid marketing. I've done the paid marketing on the major channels. It doesn't do, it's literally done nothing. It's literally done nothing. Word of word of mouth and trust and building something that everyone knows every time they go back to it will be the same amount of quality. That matters more than everything. That is marketing, uh, especially in a world where 95% of the stuff that you find online is flimsy and repeat, repetitive and just trying to sell you something. 
I think what you're saying is particularly true in niches like ours, where it's like, you know, the number of people out there who like the kind of stuff you and I do is, is really relatively small. So, you know, paid advertising is not going to generally do well just because, you know, um, the, the, the sum total, you know, I, I, I think the way I think about it is this, it's like over the next 10 years, 20 years, if you keep what you're doing, what you're doing, I keep doing what I'm doing. We're both going to have pretty damn big audiences, but they're still going to be super niche. Like there's probably only, a, you know, tens of thousands of people out there who, who exist, who are like, who want to go super deep on, you know, Rudolf Steiner and the stuff that you go into. Right. So it's like, um, you can have a very, very nicely sized large audience of many tens of thousands of people, but in the global scheme of things, you know, the, the, the few tens of thousands of people who exist, who want to go deep on that stuff all the time, it's just a small market. So it's going to be really, really hard to find any of those people through like, you know, paying for Facebook ads or something like that. Um, and so in our world, it's really, really based on, um, yeah, like you said, having really targeted content and really getting that word of mouth. Like what you want is to make stuff that's like so fire for the certain type of person that they tell their friends who and their friends with that type of person. I, right. I, um, I would say to people, don't worry yeah. about that, though, because, you, 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 you know, this is something you put forward. And it was when I did business and studies in school, they, they this was the one thing they should have taught. People have this idea of business, like I'm going to start business and there's, we need like hundred thousand customers and i say to people like if you start a business on your own 200 people 10 bucks or 10 dollars a month you've got income that you it's not amazing but you could live off 200 people is not much and that's what you need to think about right when you start like but people go into it like how am i gonna market this to it's like just don't you just you like you know this is a big thing for you that you need a a, a loyal trustworthy small amount of people who just believe in you Right. I completely agree with that. I mean, for what it's worth for people listening to give them like full balance, I, I do think that for uh, a totally different type of podcast, I do know from the research, because I've looked into a lot of this and, you know, I study this basically to try to understand, you know, uh, how all the stuff works and, and the way that media is going is something I pay a lot of attention to. I know that some of the biggest podcasts do definitely grow by paid advertising, but it's just a different type of podcast. You know, if you look at, if you look at shows like kind of big tent shows, like uh, something like the Jordan Harbinger show, for instance, like it's a massive, massive podcast and it's a certain type of podcast though. It's like, you know, just um, they go for as many famous people as they can. They try to kind of generate these like, uh, you know, very good, just, you know, well distilled, well communicated insights, but f the types of insights and the types of, of guests that are maximally of interest to the literally the largest number of people in the world. That type of that type of podcast can and and does grow well from paid advertising. I, I do know that, but I just think your point still stands that for our types of of content and for people who listen to the podcast, people who do kind of you know genuinely um, uh, intellectual niche types of research and and and, and thinking, it's just not going to work, and you shouldn't even really spend any time trying. Um, or, or burn any money trying. And that at the end of the day, doing uh, really excellent content is, I, I agree with you. I think it is essentially the, the most important form of marketing. I do think that, uh, you know, some of the, some of the launch strategies and, and, and tactics that one can execute to, to just like get projects a little bit of a head start at the beginning to, to kind of get them into as many people's, you know, um, uh, view as possible when you're like launching something or, or that sort of thing. I do think there's a lot of work that can be done there that independent creators and independent writers should know how to do that. And, and, and it is, it is worth the effort and it's worth knowing how to do that. But ultimately I, I do agree with you that, that the quality of the content and the, the targeted, the targeted nature of the content, no, you know, knowing, knowing what you're all about and therefore what your, your readers and listeners are all about, um, is, is probably the most important thing. In a previous part of the conversation, you, you kind of alluded to people like Deleuze as, you know, uh, kind of people that you were formerly interested in, but that now you have a more kind of skeptical view of it, it sounded like that, that was the implication. And I think this is worth talking about. I, I would love to hear this. Um, I think you had a tweet recently that said something to the effect of, oh, I think you mentioned uh, John Michael Greer, who said, and you quote, you, you quote him as saying, quote, all that Deleuze, Derrida stuff, you know, anti-Oedipus, deconstruction, etc." You got to be careful with all that. We've known people to actually go crazy by going down that path. And and you said you think about this often. So talk about that a little bit more. Um, you know, how do you currently see now that you've, you've converted to, 
you know, n- n- now that you're a trad calf officially, you know, <laughs> how, how, how do you, how do you look back on the work of someone like Deleuze and, and how do you see it? I think, um, you know, I'm really fond of that quote, even though it's sort of bandied around of, you know, sip from the sip from the cup of philosophy, you end up an atheist, you finish you finish the drink, you end up Christian, right? That like going right round, which is really what we've both done. And I think I see people such as the Lurs Derrida, these 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 people who clearly atheism would that is definitely, I think, has to be a part of their philosophy in a certain sense. Otherwise it might even fall apart. I see them as people who are smart enough to come back to God, but they sort of double down. And it's almost like a panic of developing ideas, developing themes, developing things which can somehow like out trick the basic. I think that was me. I mean, a lot of it is sunk cost, I think, for some people is can it just really be this simple and this beautiful? Um, You know, is the answer really just this simple? And ultimately it is. And it takes a lot to admit that after years and years of talking about body without organs and thinking that the world is this super complicated thing. whatever that's not to say i don't still enjoy them but i enjoy them in a different sense oh i enjoy them almost like you read fiction or something now it's like oh i wonder what they're gonna do i wonder what they're gonna come up with (laughs) interesting i I, but i guess do you think there are more profound risks because that seems to be what's suggested by john michael greer in that quote and i I mean i think you see this today right it's now very popular there's a certain kind of style of, of schizoid writing and speaking that is actually very much in fashion right now. And I do think that if you're, if you look at that stuff, honestly, you know, it it does really become a kind of cultivated insanity. Like you, you can actually become dumber and dumber and, and crazier and crazier to the point that you lose control of, of, of reality. Maybe you become very vulnerable to manipulation. And before you know it, you're, you know, um, you're, you're, you're being trafficked in some kind of crazy cult or something like that. Right. So it's like, um, you know, how, how, I was just curious, like how how literally do you take uh, John Michael Greer's admonition there, um, and and do you do you take do you see this as as a serious problem? Like, it, is the world becoming schizo poisoned to it to a serious oh, degree? It's it's a serious problem. I mean, I I would hark back to um, Ernest Becker's definition of autism and schizophrenia as the spectrum, whereas where autists on one side take very constrained rules and filter the entire entirety of reality via those rules and everything's like related back to them and it's very rigorous very defined and schizophrenics are basically people who have so much data and information but they have no rules of how to actually do anything with it and that's how i feel people are at it's like yeah we're, we're absolutely bandied with a ton a metric ton of information every single day but we have no objective realities or anchors of how to deal with it god gives you those objective realities very very clearly and um basically what happens as we mentioned with atheism i think the new atheist quote unquote new atheist phase of the early 2000s it did feel for them and it felt for me when i was you know 12 13 or whatever uh it felt like something new was there and it was being developed and it was almost like, wow, this feels very fresh and it feels like atheism had never been found before. And I think at that stage it was quite refreshing and it almost felt like, all right, we're, we're doing the steps to try and replace it and try and find a replacement. And ultimately the late, the late twenties came and people like Sam Harris, Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens were still repeating the same ad hominem attacks on Christianity and monotheistic religion and they committed the tyranny of basically interjecting a question without ever giving an answer. So they they were like, yeah, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, get rid of this, rip this up. And they never gave any foundation as to what happened. So you, anyone who's remained within that, I think has now become old enough, mature enough and self-aware enough to understand that they might still believe atheism is true, but they also understand that atheism actually is give, affording them absolutely no meaning and purpose. And so they're in this like double bind of, I still believe in this thing, but this thing will never offer me a purpose. And so they have to like double down and they've, they're, they're, it's almost like, it's like waiting for Godot, but someone has actually proved that Godot is not going to come. So it's like, what do you do then? That's what I'd say. And that's why I think people are going mad. Your new book, Be Not Afraid. Uh, I'm going to put links in the show notes so um, people can easily go find it. Uh, I recommend it. Go pick up a copy. Uh, that's James's newest book, his third book. And uh, James, thank you for coming on. This is a fascinating, uh, you know, wide ranging discussion. So I'm grateful. And uh, thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. Yeah. This is fun. Thanks, man. Thank you very much.